All right, welcome back to 164. Today, too, has nothing to do with Angry Birds, but uh, just out of curiosity, is anyone here among the 10 million people that downloaded it this weekend? I was. Oh. I've wasted a couple hours already. So it's available for 99 cents, and it also exists apparently on Macs and uh, maybe Android, too? Maybe not. No. Yes? OK. All right, anyhow, completely unrelated. Um, speaking of games, though, I thought it might be fun to play a round or two of Evil Hangman. So here we actually have my own implementation of this. Yours does not need to look exactly like this, but it does, of course, have to be consistent with the specs. Um, so here we have uh, my implementation. I've queued it up for a four-letter word. And down below the blue bar, you can see what letters we haven't yet guessed. So can I have a letter, please? OK, I'm guessing A, incorrect. E, incorrect? I. I. R. R. Okay, you messed up the pattern. All right. H. I heard H. I heard O. Ooh. Nice. S. S. Moop. <laughs> I, I, does anyone know what that actually means? <laughs> OK, so that was Evil Hangman. Um, let me go ahead and there's no high scores since we haven't yet won. Um, well, I mean, when you put in a dictionary of 214,000 words, um, it's a pretty big vocabulary. So when you play with, against your roommates, um, you might want to queue up a smaller dictionary. Uh, for instance, on the projects page of the course website, we actually put a small .plist file, which actually just has some words from the spec. But you could absolutely add to that things like cat and dog and puppy and whatnot so as to really mess with your roommates. But let's turn evil off and go ahead and back to the front here. Start a new game, four-letter word. F. F. <laughs> you? <laughs> I heard E. <laughs> A. S. Oh, non evil hangman's pretty hard, too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, <laughs> all right. So, anyhow, we lost twice. But that is Evil Hangman. And if you're struggling, I thought I'd give you a little teaser of what my code looks like here. So this is my implementation. Um, <laughs> all right. So without further ado, a bunch of fun things on the agenda today that should hopefully help you as you also start thinking about what you want to do for your student choice project, which is the fourth and final for the course. Um, so today we'll look a bit more at views and the general hierarchy of an MVC type application in this environment. The notion of localization, which is too often underappreciated by startups, especially when you're first starting out. It's sort of natural to start coding things in the language with which you are most familiar. And I don't mean programming language, I mean English. But it's actually super easy in a lot of languages, Objective-C among them, to actually internationalize your application so that it's super easy to add English and French and Spanish and Chinese so long as you actually have access to people who speak those languages and can help with the translations. We'll look at storage, some of the means by which you can actually save information persistently in an iOS device. Uh, gesture. So thus far, we've pretty much just tapped on the keyboard, but you can pinch and scroll and zoom and so forth on these devices. So we'll give you a sense today of how to do that and also how the implementation of that relates to some fundamental design patterns, among them delegation, which we've seen before and we'll continue to see. And then also we'll take a look at some two-dimensional core graphics so that for your fourth project, if you would like to do something a little more graphical and a little less UI kit based, which are the little, wizzy, uh, the little widgets that you can drag and drop into an app, um, you can go that direction as well. So. Here's a picture that might hopefully um, give a sense, certainly as you dive into project three, two, as to how everything works in an iOS application. So you do have your main routine. So we start up here at top left. The user taps some icon, and main is the same function that's executed. But as we just saw, there's really not much in there. And in fact, you should never really put anything in there yourself, because it immediately calls UI application main, which is part of the uh, iOS SDK. And that kicks off the much more interesting process of running these apps. Load main UI file is apparently one of the first things that happens. But what does that actually mean? What is a UI file so far as we've seen? What's it referring to? 
So it might be referring really to a nib, the thing that you create with an interface builder, a nib file, a .xib file. Or today, we'll see that you actually don't need to use this drag and drop interface. You can actually implement your user interface entirely programmatically. And indeed, that's what some folks do, either for religious reasons or simply for the、uh, flexibility of it. Finally, initialize the app. This can take the form of any number of、uh, methods, but we'll see some of the common paradigms today. Once the app moves into the foreground, let me scroll down here. It's this circle that pretty much governs these mobile applications. They just sit there in a loop, not quite an infinite while loop that's just there uh, uh, throttling itself again and again, but listening every few milliseconds or every few microseconds for some form of user input. And then the moment something is touched or pressed, or you get some push notification from a server, or the clock changes time, then the event. That was triggered is actually handled in some way from left to right. And so when we're implementing a lot of the methods inside of these classes, especially these view controller classes, pretty much your app is otherwise just sitting in this event loop. And this is very common with most any GUI based application, whether it's mobile or not. So if you're finding yourself a little confused diving into Project 3's implementation, and it would help to at least remember this kind of flowchart, complex though it looks at first glance, realize that pretty much all the magic happens once you reach that event loop. That's where your own code. Gets executed. All right, so recall that last week we took a look at、uh, this little application, which allowed me to type in my name at the top, allowed me to hit go, and then it would just say hello to me. And then we tried to clean it up a little bit so that after I dismissed the alert view window, it would actually remove whatever name I'd actually typed into the text box. Well, we did this all via. Recall Interface Builder. An Interface Builder is simply the、uh, GUI editor inside of Xcode that allows us to drag and drop and create UIs relatively easily. So recall that this is what our nib looked like. And I dragged and dropped a、uh, text field, I dragged and dropped a button, and then I configured it with the preferences on the right hand side. But I also had to do some more interesting things. So the GUI is one thing, but how does the GUI actually talk? To my code. Well, the code that we care about in many of these applications starting out are those files, of course, that we see up here. App Delegate tends not to be all that interesting、um, in terms of the guts of your program, because typically you'll implement the guts of your program in one or more view controllers. And so it's really these three files that collectively compose this application the .h, the .m, and the nib file. So, what kind of code did we write inside of the view controller class? And how did we connect that to the GUI so that one could talk to the other? What's some of the jargon here or tricks that we used? So I touch a button in the UI, I click go with my finger. What happened? Yeah. Okay, so it triggers an IB action. So that's an event, button,、uh, what was it? Touch up inside is the event that Apple calls the touching inside of a button and lifting your finger. So that triggered an action, that is the invocation of a method, and that method was implemented in viewcontroller.m. So IB action is just this preprocessor directive that flags a method as being an event handler, something that can be invoked by way of Interface Builder. So if I scroll over to my UI and I forget honestly what we did last week, I have no idea how this thing's wired up with those little blue lines. You can go ahead and control click or right click on any of the UI elements, and most of this is blank, but there are two things here. So did end on exit for the tech, actually, let's do the button first. So if I right click or control click there, there's only one thing of interest. Upon touching up inside, it should pass the go message to file's owner, but who's the file's owner? Uh, main view controller. So it's an instance of the main view controller class.、Um, and files owner then refers to the .m file more concretely. So let's take a look at this go method. If I look, scroll over to my .m file and I scroll down, there's some distractions here until I get to the go method. And this is what I did. And an IB action always follows this paradigm where the return type is IB action, capitalized as such. But recall that that's just a type def in C terms to what keyword? It's just void. It means this method returns nothing. But again, IB action is a preprocessor directive that's in there, or action, it's、uh, implemented by way of a preprocessor directive, a macro, so that Xcode realizes oh, this is one of the things I should show in those little gray pop up menus when the user tries to drag or control click. All right, so ID and sender. So sender is going to refer to whom in the context of this method's invocation? 
the button. So the button is an object. It is a UI button object. And as an aside, that's a class that descends from a more generic class called UI view. So there's a little bit of hierarchy there. So the sender is that button object. So a pointer there too. But what does ID represent? Or what is it? So it's a pointer. It's kind of like a void star pointer, if you think back to C, but it's a little more versatile than that. It can actually be nil.、Um, and in this case, it's not strictly necessary to say ID. If you know that the thing that's going to be sent to this message is a UI button, you can absolutely hard code UI button star. And the advantage of that is that you don't have to do a typecast later. So, for instance, if later in this code I wanted to pass in Uh, I wanted to call a method on that button, which I don't. We're not doing anything with the button once the, it's touched. But if I wanted to call a method associated with that button, but it was just of type ID, the compiler doesn't know that that method exists because you're using such a generic type. So you could either cast it later, as you'll see commonly, or in this case, you can just be more explicit up front. But it's not strictly necessary to do that. If you especially want multiple UI widgets to call the same method. Now, what happened here? Well, self.ui,、uh, self.text field, resign first responder. So, resign first responder does what functionally? Hides the keyboard, right? It says, I'm done responding to this previous interaction. What's my default behavior? According to the documentation, it drops the keyboard. And self.text field. So, self is the self referential sort of pointer that refers to the current object. And just to be clear, what type is this object? Where are we? This is main view controller. So, the, the object in question is a main view controller object and self.text field. So, back in C, a dot signified accessing a struct field, but it's not a struct field here. What is it actually? Self.text field, yeah.、Uh, it, careful, sorry? It's a property. So, a property that's backed, so to speak, by an instance variable. But the dot notation here is an Objective C thing、um, that introduces the ability to invoke a property. But what does it mean to invoke a property? Well, what method is actually called when I say self.text field? Close. So, it's not conventionally called get text field. It would instead be called just text field. So, this would be functionally equivalent. So, self passes the message text field, and assuming there is indeed a getter that exists called text field, what will I get back? I'll get it back a pointer to the text field. And why then do we not just write it like this all over the place? It's just ugly, right? I mean, there's that. And by using properties, we also get a very compelling feature from that synthesize keyword, which is what? Exactly. You just get these automatically generated getters and setters. They don't appear in your actual code, but the compiler does implement them for you. So you don't have to write a whole bunch of annoying, tedious boilerplate code. And if you did do,、uh, have, if you know Java or did APCS or any intensive Java programming class, frankly, it just gets incredibly tedious to copy and paste all of these damn getters and setters for all of your classes. So this is a nice marginal add. So lastly, this just does the alerting. So ns string, I'm just constructing a string with a format. So this is very reminiscent of、uh, Printf, realize again that self.text field is a text field object. It's a UI text, view, a text field object, but we actually want the dot text property, which gives us back what data type probably? An NS string. And you can infer that because it's being plugged into this placeholder here. And then lastly, this very long named method, init with title, message, delegate, cancel, button titles, other button titles. Is simply the method that generates a UI alert view and initializes a UI alert view object. And then the show message, which is down here, is how we actually say show yourself. And it dismisses itself once you actually click the button. So, any questions on where we then left off last time? All right, then one question about this. This was, recall, I made a mistake. At, um, when looking at this earlier, and I had written nil instead of self, and the result was that the demo didn't work correctly. So, what does it mean to be a delegate in general? This is an incredibly common design pattern in iOS and in GUI programming generally. Or, if you're not quite sure how to express it, why are we passing in a pointer to myself to this alert view object? Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. So there's asynchronous interactions here, right? When the UI alert view pops up, it's not going to go away instantaneously because the human has to actually see it. Well, the human might be slow, might need to take a moment to read it, might not be paying attention. And so this little UI alert view, the little JavaScript style alert、uh, window, is just going to stay there. Well, it would kind of suck if the whole application ground to a halt, especially if it were like a video or a game or your email inbox where you want stuff to be happening in the background. But if this were a blocking call, Showing a UI alert view object such that nothing else could happen until the user hits the OK button, it would be a pretty crappy user experience, right? And this is what life used to be like you know, 10 years ago when you didn't have multi threaded applications. But by passing in this pointer to self, I'm effectively informing this alert view object by the way, when the user is done with you, as by pressing the button, let me know. And so delegation is all about providing pointers to an object,、uh, passing a pointer to some object. So, that the receiver can then pass messages back to that without grinding everything to a halt by just waiting, 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 waiting for the return value of something like show. In other words, show can return instantly, and then eventually, when that user dismisses the alert view, I will be informed, I being the delegate. So, what is actually、uh, called? Well, let's take a quick look at our H file. In the H file for view controller, all I did up here was declare last time this go method. But notice here, I put in angled brackets this keyword. And I know how to do that from just reading the documentation for how to use the UI alert view. But what, is the, what do the angled brackets here denote? So this is a protocol. So that's saying that this class called main view controller implements this delegate, which means I implement zero or more methods that are declared in that protocol. Protocols can have required methods or optional ones. So this is saying I am implementing all of the required methods, if any, and maybe some of the optional ones. Well, what is the one in question? Well, if we scroll up to the very top, this is the only method. That I borrowed from the documentation for alert view interaction. It's called alert view did dismiss with button index, and it pretty much does what the name describes. When the UI alert view is dismissed by the user touching that button, this message is passed to the main view controller object. I'm given a pointer to the original alert view object that I instantiated, and I'm also given an integer, which is either 0 or 1 or 2, depending on how many buttons there were in that little pop up, and then I can simply respond. To that key press. And what I did rather、um, anally was just clear out the text field itself so as to start this silly little game again. But I wanted to do that only when the user clicked the button, not instantly when the user originally clicked the go button. So, any questions on this general paradigm of delegation? It's something you'll indeed need to be comfy with for Evil Hangman's implementation. If only because the flip side view controller that you get for free from the template is implemented using this exact same paradigm. So the flip side, when you click done, can inform the front side that, in fact, it should flip itself back around. Any questions? All right, so let's do a little something easy in, let's say, Spanish. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new Xcode project,、uh, iOS. I'm clicking Coco Touch. At, whoops,、uh, and、uh, nope. I'm clicking application and then single view application. I'm going to go ahead and name this Hola1.、Um, we're going to uncheck unit test for today. I'm definitely going to leave automatic reference counting checked, as you should for the project. I'm going to go ahead and just save this onto the desktop for now. And I get a little canned application. What does this thing look like? Well, if we just rebuild it real fast with Command R, it's going to be an incredibly underwhelming application that just has a view. And nothing else to it. So let's actually say something here to the user. Let me go ahead and quit, quit the simulator. Let me open my only nib file. On the right hand side, let me go ahead and drag a little label here. I can make sure everything's nicely centered over here and over here. And then I'll center the text. And I will just say hello. But then I realized that if I want to be able to sell this not to just English speakers, I want to sell it to Spanish speaking people as well. It'd be nice to internationalize this thing. Well, if your UI is entirely implemented in a nib, it's actually super simple. I can simply click on my nib file, click on the inspector over here, and scroll down to where it says localization on the right. 
And adding another language is literally going to be as simple as choosing, let's say, Spanish from this drop down. Now notice that I have two local,、uh, locales here. And if I scroll back up, notice what happened to my nib file. So Xcode gave me just two files. So it's a little annoying that now I have to somehow, if I make changes to one, I have to make changes to the other. But if you are, your UI is relatively simple, as this one certainly is, my English one here looks the same. But if I now choose the Spanish one, I can go in here and say, hola, instead. Save this whole thing, and now notice English, Spanish, English, Spanish. I'm going to go ahead and run it. And because my little simulator is in English by default, I should say hello. And I indeed do. Now, if this demo works, I'm going to go ahead and click the home button, go back here to settings, go to general, international, change my language to Spanish, done. It's going to reconfigure itself. It's adjusting the language. And now, hola one says hola. All right. Very fancy. Just doubled my revenues in the store. All right. So, this is not all that scalable, though, because you're certainly not going to isolate all of your strings just to these nib files. So, it's a quick and dirty way of internationalizing something、um, if most of your text is actually in the UI. But suppose we want to do things a little more generally. I'm going to instead, this time, going to create another single view application. We'll go ahead and call it Ola2 for version 2, leave all the other defaults the same. And this time, what I'm going to do. Is still put a label in the middle here. So let me drag a label into the middle of my UI. I'm going to go ahead and center it as before, just in case one language's word is a little bigger than the other. This way it can grow to fill the whole width.、Um, I'm just going to leave it called label for the moment. But now in my code, I'm actually going to have in my implementation of this thing code that's programmatically going to change whatever word it is that I want to say, whether it's hello or ciao or hello or hola or something else entirely. So in my .m file this time, I have a few options for where I can actually implement this. So, this again is viewcontroller.m. This is exactly the same thing we were looking at earlier. So, let's just skim some of the default things that are in here that we can pay attention to or can ignore. So, the one at the bottom just has to do with rotation. I don't really care too much about this, so let's just wave our hands at that for now.、Um, we're just going to support the、uh, portrait upside down.、Uh, we're going to support、uh, three of them actually by default here, except for upside down. Then there's view did load, and then there's view did unload. So, what are these? Referring to. Well, recall that when main executes, it calls a function called UI application main, and then UI application main、uh, instantiates the app delegate class. And the app delegate class has that very long method called application did finish launching with options. And what does that thing do? Because that's the point at which finally we get to do something with the code. Well, again, and this is the same in almost all of the templates in the .m file for application delegate. You see code like this, whereby you configure the window to fill the screen in this case. And then the second line of code below the green comment is the most compelling. Self.viewcontroller gets viewcontroller alloc in it with nib name viewcontroller. So it's that line of code that once we go from main to UI application main to app delegate, finally this guy says, give me a viewcontroller object and initialize it with the nib file. And then go ahead and remember this in a property called self.viewcontroller. And what then happens is, because of that third line of code, self.window.rootViewcontroller, the app delegate is essentially informing itself this is the guy who should now take control of this application. The first thing to show should be this viewcontroller. But a viewcontroller is a functional class, it's a controller, just like in PHP, that kind of arbitrates among all of your models and views. So, what is it the user actually sees? It's something called a view. Right? So, just like in PHP, we had views and Code Igniter, so does iOS have views. So, it's this view controller that apparently constructs this thing called a view, the V in MVC, and then shows that. So, again, the story here is main, UI application main, app delegate, view controller, and then the view is actually going to get displayed. So, where have these views, where have the Vs in MVC been coming from with all of these apps thus far? Where did I create this view? In the nibs file. The nib files, right, exactly. So in the nib file, I've been doing dragging and dropping and creating a user interface. A user interface is a view. So the fact that this line of code here is initializing the view controller with that nib, that means get your view from this XML file. Even though we don't see it as XML, we see it as this cute little drag and drop 
interface. So finally, all of this layering and abstraction gives us finally a view. Well, and that view is embodied in here. So at the moment that view is loaded, this message is passed to the view controller. In other words, once uh, the OS, the device, is done loading all of that XML and all of your text fields and buttons and any other widgets you dragged and dropped there, this method, view did load, is invoked, which gives you a chance then to make any refinements to the user interface that you want, to actually display the user's name, maybe the high scores, stuff that you couldn't have known in advance to hard code into the nib file if it's dynamic information. And something like different strings, English or Spanish, are certainly dynamic strings. So what I can do here is this. I'm going to replace the comment with a call to self.label.text gets ns localized string. And I'm going to pass in a key of, oh, what do I want to change the text to? Well, let's just call it something like greeting. And then I'm going to pass in nil. The second argument is what's called a comment. But Xcode doesn't like this. Even though intuitively I want to update the label on, in the nibs, text string, to be whatever the return value is of this generic greeting. But how do I actually access programmatically that UI label? What have I forgotten to do here? What's that? So uh, tagging it, what do you mean by tagging it? Good. I don't know which label. In fact, for so far as my code is concerned, I don't have any labels in uh, programmatic access to any of my labels thus far. So typically when we've done this, we go into the H file. And inside of the interface, what do I do? I do property, and then I do something in parentheses, and then I do UI label, star label. And then inside of the parentheses, I have to decide how to handle this. And thus far, what we've done is non-atomic. We want it to be read-write. And then in this case, I'm going to call it something weak. And again, we'll come back to this notion of weak and strong. But for now, it's just going to be what we'll call a weak pointer. All right, so that's fine. So now let's see if Xcode stops complaining. If I go over to view controller, the red, angle, uh, the red uh, bang has gone away. It's still yelling at me, even though I've compiled OK. Yeah, this is bad. So remember seg faults from C? This is the kind of stuff that's going to happen if you do something wrong here. But here's the key message. Unrecognized selector sent to instance OX something. So it did something bad regarding pointers. So what have I still forgotten to do in this application? What's that? So I did. I did forget to synthesize. So that property doesn't actually exist yet until I do synthesize, label, and then I specify what instance variable to use, which we'll call label by default. So that should make him stop complaining. And I need to do one other thing. Kevin? Can you do connect it to like an IP outlet? Yeah, exactly. So I further need to specify that this thing is actually an IB outlet so that I can see it in Xcode. So I can say IB outlets here. And then over in my nib file, hopefully then I can say I want to click and drag from files owner down here to the label, let go, and sure enough, the available outlets are view. And don't be confused here. View is something you get because of the class hierarchy, because this thing is a descendant of the UI view class. The one that's not currently labeled is the one I want. So now I have programmatically linked my nib to my code. So hopefully, this line of code will actually spit something out. But what is greeting? There's one last thing here that I haven't yet done. What am I missing still? Well, over here, I haven't actually created this mappings of greeting. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to just uh, right click or control click in supporting files. Though I could technically put this anywhere. I'm going to scroll down to resource, and I'm going to create a strings file. So in my strings file, I'm going to very intentionally call this localized strings dot strings. And then, actually, did I get this right? Let me do this. Let me not goof on my naming. Not hangman. Uh, let me go into here. Uh, Sorry, localizable.strings is what I wanted. So I've created a simple text file here called localizable.strings, and all I've put in here is the equivalent 
of this here. So I hard coded this capital greeting, which is just meant to be like a constant of sorts. I've specified that in the English version of this file, put quote unquote hello world. And then in the Spanish version of this file, which I created just as before by actually clicking in the little inspector over here on internationalization and localization and clicking the plus to create Spanish. In the strings file here, now I have hola mundo, which is going to be plugged in instead of that. And I can even, in another file here, if I go down to info. P list names. Notice that you can even exercise fine grained control over the icon and the word that the user sees in the interface. So, if for your English speaking folks you want the app to be called hello, but for the Spanish speaking folks you want it to simply be called hola, this will actually programmatically change what they see on the device itself. So, if I go ahead and run this now inside of the simulator after quitting the old instance. Hopefully, I should see really the same effect, but now hopefully you can infer the flexibility of out punting all of your strings to this big file. And what you would typically do as the programmer is you write the English version of that file and you come up with these big constant,、uh, constant like structures, like greeting, which is the generic word for greeting. Then you pass off the French file or the Chinese file to a friend and say, can you please translate all of these strings in here to their equivalents? You compile that file in, and voila, you are. Localized. And all it requires is that you have the foresight to, in your actual code, not hard code NS strings, but instead use this little macro NS localized string that will actually do the symbol lookup for you. So it's that easy. You don't have to do this for Evil Hangman, but for the final project, you'll at least need to have the infrastructure in place to do this for at least one other language than English. All right, any questions? All right, so let's take a quick tour at one of the templates before we can then introduce some things like storage. Among the options here are going to be these. So, when you want to actually read data into an application that's shipped with it, or you want to write data into an application because the user generated some high scores or some preferences or the like, you have a whole bunch of options in iOS. These are just some of them. So, you have property lists, and a property list is really just what? It's just an XML file. It's standardized XML so that in Xcode you can actually see it with the little、uh, WYSIWYG editor. You have NS defaults, which some of you might have started playing with. NS defaults is essentially an NS dictionary object that is a hash map or an associative array, call it whatever you'd like, that you get by default with an iOS application that allows you to store fairly small settings like the number of Uh, letters in the words for evil hangman, or the number of guesses you want to allow the user, or whether or not evil is on or off. So, some basic default settings that you want, might want the user to change, you get this prefabbed class that allows you to do that very easily.、Um, you also have SQLite. So, what was SQLite, if you're familiar from past experience? Yeah. Perfect. So it's a SQL database. So you get select and insert and delete and update and all the semantics of SQL, but you don't actually have a full fledged database running on the server. It's just all stored in a binary file, one single file on disk. So this is nice for portable devices where you're not going to go install MySQL or Oracle onto an iOS device, but you'd really like to retain the expressive capabilities of SQL and selecting and joining and the like. So you can still do that with something called SQLite. And you can do this even in the PHP world and web world. And even I do it for projects sometimes where I want the code base. To be super portable and not require someone to create a MySQL database for me for reasonably sized data sets, everything then can stay isolated within a directory. You can store things in XML itself、uh, with iOS 5. You can store things in JSON, with which you're probably familiar from the web world. And then there's an abstraction layer called Core Data that also allows you to not have to worry so much about the underlying technology that you're using, but still store relationships among objects. So, a quick tour of a very common.、Um, Design pattern in iOS apps. So, thus far, we've only looked in any detail at the utility application and single view. Now it's time for master detail.、Um, and the code here is going to be a little more complex, but the paradigms we'll see are going to be the same as those we've seen before. So, in a master detail application, when you run it outside of the, bo out of the box, you get 
this, which sort of looks like a canonical iOS application, which you can't really see it on the screen here, but there are little horizontal lines there that represent rows in a table that if you click and drag, I am the only one that can see that something's moving here. This just looks like white on the projector. But um, if there were actually things in here, I could click edit, and then all of a sudden I could start deleting what are emails, for instance, on an iPhone or text messages or whatever. So this is a table view um, in iOS speak. So how do we go about coming up with a view? Can I zoom in and then you see the lines? OK, there's slight little lines there. So the goal is to make this big white interface and actually put stuff in it. So let's take a quick look here. You start off looking at an application, whether it's your partner's code or some template or some project off the web. How do you start to wrap your mind around how it works? How do we start this tour when no one's telling you in a PDF where to look? All right, so let's look at the app delegates. I'm going to start with the .h because that's usually the smaller of the two. And there's nothing in here I haven't seen before. So I'm going to turn my attention then to the m file. In the m file, Let's see. There's a little something of interest here. It's a little ugly because of the font size, but let's see what's going on. Self.window, that looks the same. OK, so this time it's not instantiating a main view controller or a view controller. It's apparently called master view controller. Um, and this is instantiated, it looks like, the same as before. But this is interesting, navigation controller. So it turns out that this class here is actually implementing, let's see, master view controller. So notice that the master view controller object is not inheriting from UI view controller, but from UI table view controller. So again, this has to do with OOP. So there is UI view controller, which is the thing we've been talking about for two weeks. But this is a more specialized version of a UI view controller that allows you to have tables so that when you click on one of those entries, everything slides to the left and you see more data. Click again, slides to the left, just like an email inbox or a lot of database applications. So this is apparently descending from this. So the app delegate is simply saying this is going to be the class that drives this whole application. All right. Well, down here, it's all comments, comments, comments. So that's just the stub code that we're going to ignore. If I go into masterViewController.m, it looks like now, oh my god, there's actually a lot of code here that seemingly needs to be understood. But let's not worry about that so much for now. Let's just focus on the method names. And we can kind of cheat here and look up in here. So in this file, we apparently have these methods defined. At the very top, we have init with nib name bundle. So init, any init method is essentially like the method is the method that does the initialization of the object. So that happens to be inherited from a parent class. View did load, when does that get invoked? Silly question. When the view loaded, right? So after any nibs have been unserialized and the view has been loaded into RAM before the user sees it, that gets called in case you want to make some tweaks like we did with hello and hola. View did unload is the opposite. Opposite Should auto rate to rotate to interface orientation, does what it says. Insert new object, that has to do in this case with just inserting a new row into this table. But now things get interesting down at the bottom. So under the bold faced table view here, we apparently have all of the methods that are somehow involved in the display of tabular data with iOS. So let's actually take a look at this, but in the context of a concrete example where you can actually see the rows. So I'm going to go ahead and open up an example here in today's code called plist for property list. And let's take a look at what I actually included in this code. It's very simple, but it's based on a very similar model uh, of that. So small.plist. This is an XML file that has only the four letter words that we described at one point in the spec for project uh, two. So what is this thing actually? Well, let me go into my file system and go into plist, not pong. Oh, pong is coming, by the way. plist, plist, and small.plist. Let me go ahead and open this with a text editor. So when we keep saying these things are XML, it literally is. So I just made that by hand with a text editor, storing those words in what's called an array element. And Xcode then simply depicts this for me in these little drag and drop interface like this. So small.plist contains these words. And my goal for this application is to make, wait for it, this. All right, I know. 
Took me a while. So um, let's motivate this so you actually care. So maybe you want to display high scores in a game where you've got the data stored in some storage format. Maybe it's a property list, maybe it's SQLite, but the point is you have to select that data and then iteratively add row, add row, add row, add row. How do we get to the point of a UI like this? Well, let's take a look over in the code. So I actually started this example to keep things simple with just the single view template. So I didn't get a whole bunch of、uh, code from Apple that I had to then understand. So my app delegates. Is the same as usual. My view controller.m, though, or actually, let's look at the nib, is quite simply this.、Right, this is a silly little thing that Xcode does, whereby when you create a table view, you get these default、uh, California locations. These are just, that's their representation of a table view. That data is not actually there. How did I do this? Well, let's undo it and redo it. So that's what I started with, as with any application. And if you scroll down in these widgets, down, down, you'll see table view. I literally just dragged and dropped that into the interface so I could get some kind of table view. And then, so that I could actually talk to it, notice what I must have created. There's these two linkages. So a table view has two properties that come with it one called data source, which is going to be a pointer to whoever is going to be giving me the data to fill out these rows with. One is called delegate. That's the guy that, in the other direction, I am going to inform when the user does something. Now, what might you do with a table view or any application that has just tabular data? You being the human. Again, softball question. You might touch the screen, right? You might click the edit button. Any of these in user interactions might trigger events. Who do you want to delegate responses to? Well, it's whatever the delegate is. So notice that they're both mapped to files owner, which means, and files owner is as before, view controller. So the implication is that I'm going to ask that object for the data to display. And when the user touches or interacts with that data, I'm going to inform that same object. So let's take a look then on the left hand side here. Of what I actually had to implement. So in viewcontroller.h, notice what I've done. It descends from viewcontroller because it just came from the default template. And now here, let's take a look at a couple of design decisions that I had to make. So one, I implemented this method init with nib name bundle. So you can have init methods. And we looked at that in the student class and those examples we made ourselves. But now that you're starting to use the iOS SDK itself, you can't just make an init method and hope that someone's going to call it. Because indeed, you want this method, you want to put your initialization code in the method that's actually invoked. So notice what I did here. In my app delegate, I noticed that, all right, well, when a view controller is allocated, this is the method init with nib name. Bundle that's actually called. So I wanted to learn a little something about that. So I held Option or Control rather. No,、nope, Option. And then notice it becomes blue. I click on it. I get a little cheat sheet, sort of like a man page for it. If I click on the book, I get the full fledged documentation for this class. And indeed, this is the method that's called to return a newly initialized view controller with the nib file in the special,、uh, specified bundle. So, what's a bundle? Bundle generally refers to the application itself. Like when you compile your code and you include all the images and source code and plists in it, that's a bundle. So, what did I do? I simply copied the method signature here, like you might have done from a man page in C. I then went into my code for my view controller, pasted it, and then I started implementing it. So I did stuff here. All right, so what did I do? This is the stuff I put in there. So this recalls the paradigm from last week that you just have to do when writing your own init method. You call the superclasses, identically named method. You assign the return value to yourself. And if the return value is non nil, Nothing went wrong, you can proceed to do your initialization. So, this is like checking for null in C. Well, what do I want to do when this application is loaded? I want to simply load all of the words from that property list. So, how do you do this? And this is actually germane to project two if you choose to use property lists. Well, first, I construct a string called path, and then I ask the main bundle, that is the thing the user has installed on the iPhone, to give me the path for the resource called small that's of type. P list. So this really means get me the full path, C colon backslash or whatever, to small.plist. Now on the iPhone, it's obviously not C colon backslash, but the same idea. Then what do I do? 
Well, then I declare an NS array pointer, and then I say, give me an NS array, actually allocate it, and initialize it with the contents of this file. And thankfully, the NS array class has a method that someone else wrote called init with contents of file that knows how to do exactly that. You hand it an XML file or specifically a plist, it will just take care of the rest for you. And voila, you now have an array of the very data that we had in the XML file. And then this line here is doing what? This third and final line. What's the point of this line? Yeah, in back. It's just basically oh. taking your array that you generated and sticking it in your somewhere where you can keep track of it. Perfect. So it's just taking this array that I declared locally with the words pointer, and I'm storing it inside of the object itself by way of the property. So self.words is apparently a property that I defined. And indeed, notice right up here in the same file, I have declared a pointer of type ns array to words, and I have synthesized it down here. So in other words, this is my way of storing it inside of an instance variable, but doing that with the syntactic sugar of my property. All right, so not to press too hard here, because I know this is kind of a lot, and it's a little mundane walking through lots of code. But this is new, what I did up here. I'm still in the M file, and I've put a property inside of my M file. Previously, though, all of our properties were declared where? So in the .h file. So I'm kind of changing what I've been doing up until this point. Does anyone want to propose why, uh, comment might give it away, uh, why I've put the property in the m file now instead of the h file? Yeah. OK, good. So I want it to be private, as the comment denotes. But specifically, if I want it to be private, that is not accessible by other people, well, other people don't, aren't going to import an m file. What are they going to import with sharp import? Well, an h file, right? And as soon as I put my properties in an h file, that means that I'm advertising to the world, I have this property. Feel free to use it, right? That's the implicit implication there. So by relegating my property that only I care about and no other object in this entire program should care about the fact that I have a pointer to an array of words, better design would say keep things private. Unless you need to expose them publicly, you might as well encapsulate it further inside of your code. Now, this little trick here we mentioned only briefly a couple weeks ago, but when you use at interface in an M file, so recall that we've almost always used at interface in the H file. When you use it in an M file and you put a pair of parentheses afterward that are empty, this is what uh, Apple calls a class extension. This means take the existing interface, add these properties to it, but you can do this now in the M file so that they're effectively hidden. So the rule of thumb here is quite simply, if you're writing a property or even declaring a method that only this class should ever have to call, it's effectively private, don't put it in the H file. Only put in the H file things that you want other classes to know about. Now I say that this is private property. But the reality is that there really isn't enforcement of a lot of these notions of privacy in iOS. And indeed, a lot of the times when people are taking advantage of undocumented features of iOS, it's because they've somehow figured out that there is a foo method. And the foo method is this magical thing that allows you to tether your phone, for instance, wirelessly to a laptop. Because that functionality is there, it's just Apple's not advertising it in the SDK. So if you pass messages, to an Objective-C object, and that message is implemented, it will get called, even if you've tried to hide it from other people. So realize this is a design pattern that's a good convention to adhere to, so that your partner knows shouldn't call this, so that other programmers know shouldn't call this. But the reality is, is that adversaries or very creative hackers can figure out that these things exist nonetheless. So it's not so much a security mechanism as it is a design principle, at least in Objective-C. Other languages like Java enforce this much more rigorously. All right. Lastly, I say strong here. So let's try to tease this apart slightly. So previously, when I had an IB outlet, it was weak. Now I've said strong. Why? Any thoughts on what weak and strong are actually doing for me? Yeah? Charles? 
So it does. It has to do with this feature called reference counting, which Objective-C has underneath the hood and publicly had until last summer when Apple uh, made programming easier for the masses by adding this thing called automatic reference counting, which recall was that checkbox I checked. So at the risk of oversimplifying for today's purposes, know this. No, in none of our code yet have we ever called free or the equivalent of dealloc. We have, oh, we've called alloc, but we never actually free that memory. And this is in stark contrast to C, where anything you mallocked, you then called free on. Well, Objective-C is a little more sophisticated now than C, whereby it keeps track for you of memory that you've allocated. And effectively, when it goes out of scope, it is freed automatically for you. But here's the problem. If you have allocated memory and you don't want it to go out of scope, because some number of seconds or minutes later, you might want to access that same array of words after the user has walked away from the device and comes back. In other words, met the method that allocated that array has returned already. You need to tell the compiler, keep this pointer around. Do not let the OS reclaim, thus free, this memory. So by saying strong here for this property, this is sort of planting a stake inside of this object saying, don't let the OS take this away from me. I keep this resident in memory. Whereas weak says, eh, keep it around as long as you like, but I don't really care if it goes away. Now, why the difference then between this and the IB outlet? So just intuitively, it's probably pretty reasonable to expect that if you declare an NS array and its purpose is to store words and you don't want them to go away, strong feels like the right semantics to use. Right? Keep this around. As an aside, how is that implemented? Essentially, inside of every object in Objective-C, there's a counter that starts at 1 when it is actually allocated. All right? And then if you go out of scope, that count is decremented to minus one, minus one, so you go back down to zero. As soon as an object's reference count is zero, what do you think happens? The, uh, the operating system frees that memory. It's similar in spirit to garbage collection, familiar with this term, but it's a little better in that garbage collection is often invoked non-deterministically once in a while to reclaim memory. Reference counting, when things go to zero, they're typically immediately reclaimed, which is typically better for performance, at least so far as the user is concerned. Um, so. If then I allocate this array and it's by default one, but can very easily go to zero when it goes out of scope, by specifying strong, what does its reference count actually go to most likely? Two, which means even as it goes out of scope, it does get decremented, but that leaves it at one, which means I still have a stake in that object, which means the iOS operating system is not going to take it away from me. Now, as an aside, had this course been offered a year ago, you would have had to do all of that plus oneing and minus oneing yourselves. And this was, I mean, frankly, it wasn't hard once you understand what's going on, but it was prone to lots and lots of buggy code and memory leaks. So in general, a good principle in compilers is assume you're better than the programmer and start to do as much of this for him or her, which is what the OS is now doing. But you still have to provide these hints to the compiler so it knows what's going on. If I did weak, this program could very well crash or just not uh, function. And it might just happen once in a while because of the memory being taken away from me unexpectedly. And now, just as an aside, the reason that you use weak for an IB outlet is because the nib file will take, the nib file is the owner of all of the widgets that you've dragged and dropped there. So it has specified already that its own pointers to those objects will be strong. So you do not need to doubly say, keep these around. You can assume that the nib will do that for you. And indeed, if you specify strong, you might be wasting memory, because if the nib, really, and this is an oversimplification, if the nib wants to give some memory back to the operating system because that screen is no longer in view, because it flipped around, it can't do that if you've specified strong for the text view and the button and all of these other widgets. So your application could end up using more memory than it actually needs to. All right, so that's memory management in a nutshell. But we started with this, the notion of a private property. And the goal was simply to read in these words. So we'll take a break in just a moment. Let's just see which of the methods actually display this data. Because this class, my view controller, is implementing that table view controller now, because it descent, uh, because, rather, because I've specified that it's the delegate of a table view, certain messages are going to be passed to it. And among them are just a few of the ones we saw before. Number of sections in table, table view, cell for row at index path, and then down here, if I scroll down ever so slightly further, table view, number of rows in section. So here's how this works. Recall in the nib file 
that you have this structure for a table and it has two outlets, one of which is data source, one of whom is delegate. That just means, again, this thing, this UI widget, will occasionally send messages to the view controller asking for data or informing it that the user has touched something on the screen. Well, what method is it going to call when it wants to know how many rows it needs to make room for? It's going to send the message table view, number of rows in section, and what do I? The delegate have to do, or the data source have to do, I just have to answer that question. How many rows do I want? Well, I'm going to do self.words, which gives me my array, pass in the count message, it does what it says, that's going to return five, or whatever it is, number of words that I have here. So that responds to that question dynamically. Up here, this is asking number of sections in table view. If you have an iPhone or iPod or iPad, you might know that some UIs, uh, under settings especially, have little ovals of settings. And then there's a head section heading and another oval of, section of settings. And then a bold-faced header. They're sort of chunked into different sections aesthetically. This is just saying how many of those things do you want. I don't care about those aesthetics. You have one section, which means just give me a big, long view. So lastly, and the most interesting method is the one that answers the question, what should I show in row, row i? And to implement that method, I can do this, table view, cell for row at index path. So how do I implement this? It's a few lines, but at the end, they create the effect of displaying everything. So when this method is passed, it's going to effectively be passed in the number 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4, if I've got five total rows. So when passed in 0, what happens? Well, first, I have this string here. I just need a generic cell identifier. This is for reusability of cells. Let's wave our hands at this for now. This thing here gives me a pointer to a UI table view cell, which is a little rectangle. This Method here, dq reusable cell with identifier, is this. Think back to your days of data structures, linked lists. Odds are the operating system, or in this case the SDK, has a linked list of available table cells, maybe 10 of them, maybe 100 of them. And if one is not currently being used by the on screen display, it's going to grab that object and then allow you to refill it with whatever data you actually want to show. The motivation here being if you have an iPhone or any device like this with limited screen real estate and you actually have 100 entries in it, what things do you absolutely have to keep around in memory? Just these 10 rows. You don't need the other 90 rows kept around in memory. So the idea here is that as soon as you start scrolling up and one of those cells goes out of view, you can reuse that cell to display the thing down here as it comes into view. So it's a very clever way of not allocating 100 rows at once, but just 10 at a time and reusing them. So this method means give me an object that you might have allocated already, but that's no longer in use, DQ it off of the linked list or the queue structure, and give me a pointer to it. If it's nil, that just means you don't have any lying around, so I actually have to call alloc. But once you have a cell, you can just do a couple things. I can specify that the selection style is none. This is one of these crazy Apple constants, that are enums, that's super long name, but it does what it says. It means you can't touch on the cell. It's not going to turn blue. The next thing there specifies make the, label, the text of that label equal to self.words, object at index, index path row. So this is a little more complex than we need to care about today. Think of index path as just being 0, 1, 2, or 3. It's a little more than that, which is why we actually have to say, give me the row inside of that index path. To be clear, for those of you with iPhones, if you do have these sections where you have section heading and then row, that's what an index path is. It's a tuple like section 0, comma, row 0. So you get two fields inside of the object. But for now, just think of it as a row number, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then that's it. You return the cell. And then the device knows to actually render that cell. So it's a huge amount of complexity, it seems, even though it gets much, much easier over time. But the, uh, the motivation here is just very low latency. One of the things that iOS does really well is that even if you have a dictionary of like 240,000 words, it's actually going to be pretty zippy, even showing you all of those things on the screen, because it's generally only going to keep around enough memory for only 10 of them at a time. And it's much faster than the human's finger at reusing those to create this very seamless scrolling effect. Any questions? All right, so yeah. Good question. Um, the strong property will remain so long as the parent object itself is around in memory. So if the view controller is deallocated, which won't happen in most of these examples thus far, then all of its properties will be sent a minus one message. So all of those things will sort of recursively be freed if their reference count goes to zero. So if the, if the application is going in the background, what happens to that? 
Good question. If the application goes into the background, um, typically views will be deallocated. In other words, any UI objects will be freed, which is why you're going to need to reconstruct them from the neighboring code. And we'll see an example of that today or next week. Um, but things like your NS array will not be freed. If you've specified strong, backgrounding an application won't deallocate the object, but it will try to free up things like the views, a movie that's playing, anything that's fluffy and can be reconstructed, but from code or a nib file. But an array, it would not be uh, reconstructed automatically. So strong means keep it around. So for like a gameplay of storing a game board, you can store it in the You can store the game board. If you keep, yes, if you keep the state of the board, like a two-dimensional array, um, as a strong object, a strong property, then yes, it will stick around and kill, unless the user force quits the whole application. All right, that was a lot. Let's take a five-minute break. We'll come back and start writing some 2D games. So what better motivation than this to implement uh, pinching and gestures and swiping and zooming and such? Uh, so this is Tommy version 2, much improved over a version we did uh, last year for a different course. And it will allow you, with your finger, to swipe through all of the awkward photos that I could find on Facebook for Tommy here. Um, you can't quite see my finger but as, I as I'm in the simulator, but if you hold down Option, you can see what look like two finger presses. So we'll also see how you Using two fingers, you can actually pinch and make things smaller and bigger. Um, so how to interact with this sort of application. Well, what's going on? So there are three total photos that I included inside of this project. So I constructed probably an NS array that contains maybe the file names of those three files. I've somehow registered an object as a listener, a delegate of sorts, for uh, these finger gestures so that you can actually respond to them if some message is passed. And I'm somehow distinguishing between left to right swipes and right to left, even though you can't quite see it um, on the simulator without my finger appearing. So how did I go about doing this? Well, this too is just a single view application. So I started with one of the simplest templates. And then I realized, all right, so if I've got three JPEGs, which I simply dragged into the, uh, into the app. So there is one, there is two, there is three. <laughs> and um, uh, OK, very distracting. So um, let's take a look at where we always begin the story. App delegate, nothing interesting going on there. That's all the boilerplate code, just reformatted with some comments. This too is boilerplate. Application did finish launching with options. Who gets control? Looks like view controller class gets instantiated. Then we have viewcontroller.h. There's really nothing going on in there except for this. Apparently, there's a UI alert view. And indeed, if you click and hold, you will see that, um, for instance, if we click on hold on his nose, we'll see that he yells at you if you press down on his face too long. So how do we go about doing this? Well, viewcontroller.m. So let's just get a sense lay of the land here. OK, a bunch going on, so let's start here. So one, let's pluck off the easy ones. This app apparently will only work in the portrait mode orientation. Why? Just because. I don't want to have to deal with rotating and resizing and whatnot. So I just hard coded this return value to require that the, the orientation be portrait mode. Uh, let's then scroll up. In it with nib name. So again, it's very often in these initialization methods that you won't do stuff related to the GUI because that typically will go in something like view did load. But if you have some overarching initialization that has to happen, like loading images from disk or loading data from an array, doing something once and only once inside of your view controller, odds are it belongs in whatever initialization, initialization method the app delegate is calling. And that's this guy here. So I copied and pasted its signature. I call the parent class to make sure everything gets initialized properly higher up in the hierarchy. And now I'm doing this. So I realized after trial and error that I actually need to keep track of how, uh, whether or not there's an alert view already in progress. Because in the first version of this program, if you held down on Tommy's face and held there too long, you would keep getting alert view after alert view. And you'd have to hit OK like 10 times if you held on ever so slightly too long on his face. So this is my way of just locking the UI alert view so that only one message is actually sent when you touch down on his face. So that was just in response to that. So I'm setting no, because by default there's no alert view obviously in progress. Now I prepare my array of Tommy's. So I've got apparently a property that's of type NS array. I'm allocating my array. I'm initializing it with this comma separated list of NS strings. Tommy1, Tommy2, Tommy3, comma nil. 
common mistake when you're declaring an NS array statically in this way, it has to end with nil, even though you would think、uh, the method could infer that for you.、Um, you do need to nil terminate it yourself. And then self.index equals zero. So, what are these properties? Well, if I scroll up here, I have some private properties that I've declared. Private just because no one else needs to know these exist. They don't need to go in the header file. So, I'm trying to practice that、uh, principle now. So, what do I have? This is just a Boolean alert in progress. And notice that because it's a Primitive, it's just a sign. Weak and strong do not apply. This is not a pointer. A sign just means、uh, make copies of this thing when you pass it around. Non atomic has to do with threading. Read, write does what it says. What else do I have? Well, I have this array of Tommies, or rather a pointer to an array. This is strong just as for my dictionary words before, because I definitely want these Tommies all kept around in memory. Even if the application is backgrounded, I just don't want to have to reload this array again and again and again. And it's reasonably small, so that's reasonable to keep around in memory. Index. Well, I've got an array of three things, and as you swipe from left to right or right to left, I just need to keep track of which Tommy am I showing on the screen. So this is going to be a number from 0, 1, or,、uh, 0, 1 or 2 in this case. And then lastly, there's this IB outlet. It is weak, even though it's a pointer, because、eh, I'll let the nib worry about keeping this thing around in memory. And now the UI image view, we haven't used this ourselves yet, but just as you can drag and drop buttons and text fields and tables in, so can you drag in placeholders for images. Called image views, and I simply drag this onto my interface. I made it fill the screen, and I did change a couple things. I did use things like aspect fill so that it would maintain Tommy's proportions, but it would still zoom in to fill the available space、um, and crop as needed. But I could align him in all sorts of different ways, some of which would, if scale to fill, would make him look very squished or fat, depending on the dimensions of the photo. So this just worked out well, aspect fill. And this is important because I want to be able to touch this image, which is not a typical expectation for an image. Image, I need to make sure that user interaction is actually enabled. Otherwise, no messages will be triggered when I touch on this JPEG on the glass. So, now what do I have inside of this? Well, if I right click, notice that this image view is indeed connected via an outlet to the files owner, namely the view controller. So, I clicked and dragged to make that connection. Over to the files owner. So let's see how I can now respond to some gestures as we begin to make a fancier interface here. So I've got down here my synthesized properties, I've got some alert view stuff. Let's focus on one of the easier ones first. So this thing here. So it turns out that because I have,、um, let's see, actually, let's start slightly elsewhere. Let's start down here. So we looked at init with nib name, and that's what kickstarts the object's initialization. But I then want to do some GUI related stuff only when the GUI has been loaded into memory. And that does not happen when init or init with nib name is called. That happens when view did load informs me as much. So you don't want to start touching the GUI in your init method because it might not literally have been、uh, read in from the nib. The RAM might not have been allocated. It's just it's too soon at that point. In the world of JavaScript, you think back on the method that's often called、uh, DOM ready or some variant thereof. Same idea. If you try executing JavaScript code too soon, the whole HTML DOM might not have been constructed as a tree in memory. So your code's just not going to do anything. Same deal here with the UI. So view did load needs to do a few things here. So on this first line, I'm going, to arbitrary, I'm going to first load whatever the default image is. So here I have self.imageView.image. So imageView is the object. .image is actually a property that should be set equal to a JPEG or ping or supported file format. And then here I have a UI image、uh, con- uh, class. I'm calling the convenience method named image named, and I'm specifying call self.tommies, which is an array, give me the object at index self.index. So by default, that was initialized to zero. So I'm saying give me Tommy at index zero, which is Tommy1.jpg. Then I'm passing Tommy1.jpg as a string to the message image named. So what I'm getting back now is a UI image object that's been initialized with Tommy1.jpg. And I'm assigning that to the image view property called image, and that's What makes the first Tommy appear? It's as relatively simple as that. Now, what happens next? I now need to inform the entire UI mechanism to start listening for these things called gestures. And so, with this next line of code, I'm going to listen for that long press, holding his face slightly awkwardly too long. So, I'm going to declare a pointer called long press gesture, and it's of type UI long press gesture recognizer. So, the keyword here is recognizer. This is a framework that Apple provides that allows you to recognize interesting、uh, UI interactions. I'm allocating one of these recognizers. And 
I'm initializing it with a target. So, what does this mean? This is introducing another paradigm in iOS. So, self is me, the view controller. So, you can think of this as assigning it a delegate pointer. So, inform me when some gesture is recognized, in this case, the long push. Well, which method should you actually pass, which message should you pass to me when Tommy's face is touched too long? Well, the method called handle long press. Now, the one thing we haven't seen before is at selector. So I mentioned, I think, a couple weeks ago that selector is effectively synonymous with message name or method name. And it kind of is. But really here, what I'm doing is handle long press colon is being passed to at selector. At selector is going to return a special representation of that message that's designed to be passed around. So you can think of the net effect here as being effectively a, a function pointer. Or in JavaScript, the name of a function. In JavaScript, functions are uh, actual first class objects, which means you can pass them around by their name. And the at selector syntax is allowing us to do that here as well. So that means call this message on this object myself when a long press is recognized. And the next two chunks of code are very similar, but they're for right swiping and left swiping, respectively, which means uh, when the user uh, drags in sort of a typical way on a uh, mobile device. So what happens then when I do touch on his face and a long press gesture is recognized? Well, let's scroll up to that handler. And up here we have handle long press. First I do this. If it's not the case that an alert is already in progress, and this I realized by trial and error. I was triggering so many damn alert views I put in this protection. So if there's none already in progress, go ahead and specify, yes, there is one in progress. Then go ahead and allocate an alert view just as usual. Notice that I've done this here. Hey, stop that. Fine, and so forth. And then I show it. But I'm also using a delegate in another sense here, telling the alert view, I am your delegate. Inform me when it's done. Because what do I probably want to do as soon as the user dismisses this alert view? Exactly. I want the opportunity to invert the value of alert view in progress, which I'm going to have to do in whatever that method message handler is, and that's this one here. And we've seen this before. I just need an opportunity to know to do something when the user has touched that button. So for time's sake, let me wave my hands at the swiping, but it's pretty much the same idea, except you do need to distinguish between left and right, which I'm actually doing generically with a method I call handle swipe. And I'm using a constant here uh, and a switch to determine if it was left, right, or right, left. And then here's some sort of CS50 style code where I am incrementing the index, but making sure to wrap back around with to zero with the modulo operator. But that's just some old school logic there. All right, so that's how we implement that. We can do one more where you can actually do um, affine transformations of graphics in a very similar way, but that can create this kind of effect here. So this is our transformations example. If I go ahead and compile this, it again features a familiar face. But in this case, if I take my two fingers or simulate them with the Option key and click like this, I can now zoom out and I can zoom in fairly infinitely if I keep doing it. It's not the highest quality picture, but you can see where this, this is going. Right? Think Google Maps, but with Tommy here. So how do we go about implementing something like this? Well, it's actually pretty much the same principle, except now we're actually using some C code. And this will be a good transition to Pong, which uh, you'll find reveals that a lot of the graphics capabilities in iOS are still implemented in C, partly for performance, partly for historical reasons. Um, so if you missed C, here we go again. So this is my M file, viewcontroller.m. Let's ignore this. CG point refers to core graphics point, and we'll come back to that. But I've got some private properties here, just as before. Notice I've got a pointer to an image view, so I can have a Tommy image loaded there by default. This time I have a floating point value for scale, which is going to represent 1.0, 2.0, 0 0.5, whatever the scale factor is after pinching. And then I've got another, actually, I didn't need this. I should delete this. I don't need an array of Tommy's anymore because I only included one image in this file. So I'll clean that up after. I've synthesized some variables here, but now notice I have two methods I've implemented. Handle panning, which means dragging Tommy around, left, right, up, and down. And then handle pinching, which means using two fingers to resize the image on the screen. So here's my initialization method this time. So I'm going to prepare Tommy by remembering, by default, he's at 1.0. And by default, the translation of him 
he's going to show up in this rectangle by default. But, uh, and a translation, recall, is some shifting left and right, x axis, y axis. So by default, the translation for this image is just going to be nothing. It's going to be at the topmost origin of the screen. And just to paint a picture,、um, the way graphics work in iOS. Um, this is just a quick sense, incidentally, of the sort of gestures you can recognize. So, the slide will be online.、Um, the coordinate system looks like this. In an iPhone, the 0, 0 is in the top left hand corner. So, keep that in mind as we play around with numbers. And if I go back now to the code here, I've now initialized underscore translation. What is that? Well, let me scroll back up here and aha. Underscore translation. So, this is a CG point. If not sure what this is, you can option click and you'll see that this is a C struct. And CG point is a structure containing a CG float, which is Core Graphics floating point number. It's essentially just a float, X and Y. So, this refers to an X, Y pixel coordinate location on the screen. But it's not quite pixel location, because those of you who are Apple fans might know that Apple has released higher resolution versions of things the, the new iPad, the iPhone 4 with the Retina display. Um, we'll come back to that guy maybe.、Um, so, there's actually a genericization of the notion of a coordinate system in iOS. You actually interact with an iPhone device today in terms of points, where a point might be one pixel or it might be four pixels, the sort of doubling of a pixel. So, this way you can express、uh, locations on the screen independent of whether the user has an iPhone 3 or an iPhone 4, an old iPad, a new iPad. So, you'll see the terminology of points in there that could be one to one mapped to pixels. But might also be much smaller. Case in point, the new iPad's resolution is twice that, and the new iPhone's resolution is twice the iPhone's resolution. And that would just be a nightmare, because now you would have four views, but now you can actually just have two. Because for many applications, the retina display is sort of immaterial if you're using some standard UI widgets or photo that's going to just look better by nature of it being on a better screen. So I've made this translation IVAR variable. A private instance variable. Now, this is not a property for reasons that I'll wave my hands at for now, but realize for today's purposes, a cautionary tale be careful trying to represent structs with properties. Things tend to break, and Xcode will often yell at you. And the quick teaser for why is that if you've got a property called foo and you want to access it, you would access it via this mechanism here. Self.foo, that's a property called foo. Now, suppose that foo is a struct like CG、um, point with an X and Y field. Well, back in C, how do you access the members of a struct? Dot notation. So you might say foo.x. So this looks completely reasonable, and in fact, this would work OK. a y But suppose that you want to do something like this self.foo.x plus one. Suppose you want to move the thing over one pixel. So now this doesn't actually work. Why? Because you have to go back to the basics of what a property actually is. Self.foo is just syntactic sugar for what? Passing a message, exactly. Called foo to self. Now, a struct is effectively a primitive, right? It's not itself a pointer. A struct is a struct. And think back to C. Whenever you call a function and it returns some value, if it's not a pointer, it's, it's a value, and values are passed. By copy. So, what are you going to get back when this message returns a value? You're going to get back a CG,、uh, you're going to get back a CG point, but a copy of a CG point. So that when you then say dot x, that's fine. You can access the x coordinate. But if you then try to assign it to be some other value, you're wasting your time. Why? Because you're just updating the copy. And so, understanding the underlying Details of implementation here are super important because, on one hand, Xcode will yell at you. And so, if worst case, you'll just scratch your head as to why you can't do this in iOS programming. But this is actually the reason why because you're actually calling a function and it's returning a value, but it's returning a copy of a value because of the way the stack frame works. And so, you can't actually mutate that x value purposefully. It's just going to be changing a copy, which is a useless exercise. So, in short, Beware of representing structs, which CG point is, as anything other than a local instance variable. All right, so now scrolling down, we've prepared Tommy. I've got a handle pan method, I've got a handle pinch method, I've got view did load. Let's look there then. So, again, when, learning, when reading through someone's、uh, UI type code, start with the app delegate, move on to an init method, then look for something like uh, load, uh, view did load. So, what do we have here? Same code as before. I'm listening for a pan or I'm listening for a pinch, and so this code is structurally the same as before. I'm saying inform me, self. 
specifically passing in the handle pan method, message or the handle pinch message. And how do we do this? Well, now unfortunately there's some math involved, um, which is sort of um, interesting, but besides the point for how the code itself is designed. So we'll wave our hands at some of these details. But this is how we now start doing whoops, the sexy sort of capabilities of these devices. So if handling a pan, so if I want to translate Tommy, that is shift him right, left, up, or down, I have to actually start doing some math here. So in order to figure this out, um, for today's purposes, let me go ahead and wave my hands at this, but point out some of the salient structures. So we have a CG affine transformation struct here. We have a CG point. Uh, we have this uh, helper function here, transformation concat, to actually concatenate, essentially do mul matrix multiplication. Um, if this is unfamiliar or completely uh, uh, rusty, eh, don't worry. Um, it's uh, doing transformations essentially follows this kind of boilerplate code. Um, but ultimately, what we're trying to do is shift Tommy's location by some number of points on the x-axis and the y-axis. And we can figure this out by asking the sender, and let's see where we use sender in here, we can ask the sender exactly what um, the scale, what the shift has actually been. So in other words, we're past a pointer to this recognizer. The recognizer is going to inform us how far the human finger dragged and we can then use that to infer the mathematics of translating Tommy as a result so that he effectively follows our finger up, down, left, or right. And pinching is very similar, but instead of translating him, we're instead going to update his scale and thus the size of the image that's actually being displayed. All right, but more fun than scaling Tommy is to actually implement something like Pong, which I promise you 30 years ago was a really cool game. So let's start with these last of two. Let's implement a little paddle. So this is a little paddle example that's not going to do a huge amount of interest, but it does implement the first uh, application where we're not actually doing uh, uh, just standard UI widgets. So if I this pretend the arrow is my finger, I now have the beginnings of a game called Pong. And for those unfamiliar, there's going to be a ball eventually that's going to bounce left, right, top to bottom. And the goal is with these white paddles to make sure it doesn't pass your goal. Otherwise, you lose a point. So there's something interesting going on here where I'm detecting the key press. And I'm actually translating the position of this little rectangle to match whatever that is of the arrow. I'm apparently ignoring left, right movement, but I am responding in lockstep to up, down movement. So let's see what's going on here. Well, notice in my nib file for this paddle example, all I've done is create the background here. I just made it black, and that's it. Because I decided here that I don't want to use a static image for the paddle. I can draw it myself. And indeed, we can see how to draw something as follows. I went ahead with Xcode's file menu, and I created a new object. Uh, an NS object, or rather a UI view object, which descends from NS object, and I called it paddle view. So in other words, my goal was programmatically to implement a Pong paddle, to draw a rectangle with core graphics. So I have my H file, and thankfully there's really nothing interesting there to worry about. But if I go into my M file, notice that this is how I can fairly simply draw on an iOS device. So much like in Photoshop, the world of iOS is modeled in terms of rectangles, um, pixels and x axes and y axes. And it turns out that inside of a UI view, if you're not using a nib, a draw rect method will get called automatically when that view is created. So in other words, when I instantiate a paddle view, this method draw rect will get executed. And its purpose in life is supposed to draw something on the screen. So how does this work? Well, CG rect is another struct. I can hover over this thing with option. And you'll see that it has an origin inside of it and a size. So that's what defines a rectangle here. And there's this little helper function that allows me to make a rectangle. Specifically, it's going to make it at location 0, 0, so in the very top left-hand corner. And it's going to make it 10 floating points, uh, 10 points wide and it's going to make 60 points tall. So roughly 10 pixels by 60 pixels, though it does depend on the resolution of the screen. So in this case, I now have a rectangle. I want to make this thing white. Well, it turns out there's a UI color class, and I can very easily set things to white for this rectangle just by saying, give me the white color and set it. And now notice I'm calling UI rect fill. I want to fill the square that I've just constructed with whatever color I've decided on. So in other words, line one creates the rectangle. Line two picks a paintbrush out of the available paintbrush colors. And line three actually paints that rectangle on the screen for you.
So what's interesting here? We're really actually mixing two different languages, right? Line one is what language? C. Line two is Objective-C. Line three is C. All right, so again, Objective-C is layered on top of C. And indeed, a lot of the underlying core graphics routines, a lot of the um, low-level mechanisms in iOS are still written in C, partly for performance again, partly for other reasons. So understanding the syntax, which is essentially the same, except you don't have object-oriented features in the older style C code. All right, so that gives us our paddle. What actually gives us the dynamism? Well, we can do this. So notice that I've done this here. Let me wave my hands at this a little bit just so we don't get too distracted. Here's my init method for the actual game. This is the view controller. Notice at the very top line, I'm allocating a paddle view. And I'm giving it an init with frame message that's saying 10 by 10 by 10 by uh, 60, which is just giving it a region of the screen to operate within. And then I'm effectively having it draw itself within that region, a sliver of the screen on the left-hand side. And then what is the second and final line there doing? Self.view add subview. Well, GUI programming, at least in iOS, is entirely about hierarchy and layering one thing on top of another. So you recall in uh, Interface Builder, when we've been dragging and dropping things, recall that they start creating a hierarchy of things on the left-hand side, where you can see that the table view has this, this button, or rather, this, uh, this UI view has a button inside of it. There's a text view inside of it. So in other words, you're layering widgets and widgets on top of one another, on top of some kind of canvas. And this second line of code there is essentially saying, add this rectangle to the existing canvas. And and that canvas, by default, is known as self.view. So that's the default rectangle that initially is white. When we do nothing in our application, the, self, the add subview is layering something on top of that. Or in this case, I made it black by tweaking the nib. So how do I now respond to the user's finger? Well, it's actually relatively straightforward. I have to implement this special method called touches moved with event. And now I simply have to get some details from that object and then move the paddle's location in lockstep along the y-axis. So on the left-hand side here, I have a UI touch pointer. And I'm saying, give me all the touches that just happened on any object. This is actually a simple application. I don't have to worry about multi-touch. So wherever the user touched, that's the one I care about. So that first line gives me the touch that just happened on the screen. In the second line here, I need to know where did the user touch on the screen. So if I ask the touch object, what is your location in the view, this is going to give me an xy coordinate of wherever the human's finger just went down. The only field I care about there is one of the axes of that finger press. And so over here, notice that I am, again, grabbing the finger's location. Then I'm updating the center of the paddle to be at a new point on the screen. I'm leaving its x-axis unchanged. And by unchanged, I mean just ask the paddle view where its current center is and get x and set it back equal to that value. But location is that of the finger. So I'm saying make your y-coordinate match the y-axis of wherever the finger was on the screen. And because these events are being fired continuously, again and again and again, every few milliseconds, you have the visual effect of the paddle actually tracking the finger up and down. So how do we actually now make a game out of this? Well, we have the beginnings of the user playing. Now all we need is the ability to play against a computer. So let me go ahead here and open up Pong. And in Pong, just to spoil the effect, actually, let's not spoil the effect. It'll be a better cliffhanger if you see the end result first. So this time, just to spice things up a bit, I decided I don't want to draw the paddle by default by hand. I don't want to draw the ball by hand. I have Photoshop. I'm going to make these things myself. So I made here the paddle, which looks like you can barely see it. Can you see it on the projector? No, but it's over there. It's white. <laughs> um, it looks really good, although, on this screen. And now you're really not going to see the ball. There's. I'll put the arrow at the ball. It's like a four pixel ball right there. OK, so that saved me a lot of programming effort. And frankly, it did. It's a lot easier to make a few pixels in a, a graphical editor and save them as a ping or a JPEG. So that's what I did, though it's not strictly necessary. So how, do, how does this program get kickstarted? Well, here's my app delegate. It is calling, as usual, it seems, in it with nib name. So let's go down now to my nib. And the nib, OK, so I have some stuff going on here. So 
this thing, this thing, and this thing are Im actually UI image views. So they're the same things as I used for Tommy before, but I scaled them down so that they don't fill the whole screen. So that's just where I put them by default. But we'll be able to move those image views because they're actually wrapped, again, in an object. Score left, score right, these are actually just UI labels. And I just aligned it in such a way that those words will disappear. They'll be replaced with actual numbers as score is actually kept track of here. So now if I look over in my view controller, Let's see, actually, uh, in my view controller, I have a kickoff method, which is interesting. That'll kick off the game, apparently. And now here I have a whole bunch of stuff inside. So quick tour. I have a constant declared up here. You might recall from C that you can use sharp define to declare constants. You still can in Objective C, but what's, the, what's better about this de declaration of a constant versus the sharp define? Yeah, so this actually has a type associated with it. Sharp define simply does a find and replace throughout your code, which means there's no notion of type checking there. By declaring it as an actual const, it means I get all of the privileges afforded to a float in this case. So I can't misuse this or use it in the wrong location if something expects that particular type. Here I have an IVAR that's of type CG point to keep track of velocity and velocity uh, here will ultimately be initialized to this on an x axis and a y axis. So a vector is velocity. I have a whole bunch of private properties, and most of these you can infer what they are a pointer to the left paddle, the right paddle, the left label, the right label, the ball, score left, score right. And then also I implemented a pause feature so that if you background this application, it will actually pause the game and then reload it uh, wherever it left off. Now I'm doing some boring synthesizing of all of these properties down here. So let's actually see what happens when I initialize this application for the first time. So one, I'm initializing the scores to be zero. That's reasonable to do once and only once. Uh, two, I'm initializing the ball's velocity to be a CG point make. So velocity comma velocity, you can use, you can represent a vector with effectively a point. You just need an X component and a Y component to represent that vector. Uh, so I'm just doing that to say we're going to go the same speed along the X axis as you are on the Y axis. Um, so that uh, even as I change the ball's orientation, it's going to always go in the same speed. And now we need this timer. So just like in JavaScript, if you want to do something cyclically, listening for events, this thing's going to listen every 0.05 seconds for some kind of interaction on the screen. I need to essentially constantly check, is the ball touching the paddle? Is the ball touching the paddle? Is the ball touching the paddle? Or did it go off one of the sides? I need to keep checking that, just like in Scratch, if you use that language, language a year or more back. So let's fast forward down to any view. And this is all I have for view. I did, in this game, because I've constructed a lot of it in the nib, I don't need to do as much in view did load. But I do need to start the game when the view comes into display. So after view did load, you uh, automatically call it as a method called view did appear. So just because it's been allocated doesn't mean the user can see it. When the user can actually see the state of the world, this method's invoked. So I'm going to pass the kickoff message to myself. So let's follow this, uh, bread uh, these breadcrumbs to kick off. Scroll up, scroll up, scroll up. All right, so kick off. So by default, the game is going to be paused. The ball is going to be positioned in the middle of the board, and the gameplay will be paused. I'm going to update the scores to be equal to, and here's where we just have to do a bit of NS string math. Um, I have a score left property, which is an, a number, an, uh, an integer, and a score right. So I just need to convert those to strings so that I can display them on the screen. Here's how I'm going to center the ball. I'm going to locate it at 240, 160 pixels or points on the screen. And then I'm going to line the paddles. And this was a bit of trial and error, but I decided that this is where I want the two paddles to start, on the left side of the screen and the right side of the screen. Now, when the user actually starts moving, gameplay is going to be invoked. So the play method, rather, the play method uh, is going to be invoked every 0.05 seconds. So, so long as the game isn't paused, and the game will automatically be unpaused once the user starts interacting with the screen, thanks to some code, um, play is going to get invoked constantly, again and again and again. Think of that event loop that we talked about at the start of today. If it's the game is paused, don't do anything. Just return, and we'll ask the question again in a few milliseconds. Otherwise, go ahead and move the ball. And this is I. Uh, very similar in spirit to what we did with the paddle. But in this case, I want the ball to be self-propelled. So I'm going to move the ball from its current x coordinate plus its, uh, the x velocity, uh, comma, the current y component, plus the y 
velocity. And then I need to detect goal. So if the center of the ball is less than five, in other words, if it's within five pixels of the left in the screen, that means someone just scored a goal. It got too close to the end, so the guy on the right apparently scored, plus plus. I recall kickoff, so the ball goes back to the center, thanks to the referee or whatnot. And we restart the game, but with the updated score. If instead it's five pixels to the right of the screen, so I have to do a bit of arithmetic to figure out what that is, because the coordinate system, the guy on the left is going to get a score. Otherwise, I'm not going to do anything unless the y coordinate is actually really close to the top of the wall or really close to the bottom of the wall, in which case I'm going to perform a reflection with just a little bit of arithmetic where I flip around the velocity's y component so that if you're going five miles per hour this way, now you're going negative five miles per hour so as to flip the ball in a reverse direction. So the end results here, oh, and the paddle is similar here. And uh, the specifics of the code here aren't so necessary so long as you understand the overall um, framework of the game. Here I'm just checking, are you touching the right panel, right, right paddle, or are you checking, touching the left panel? So if I then run this game, what we see here is a little game like this. And if I, as soon as I touch the screen, the ball starts moving. And if I keep my finger on the screen and move up, I'm the guy on the right. The computer is the guy on the left. Um, he's pretty much infallible, the way the game has been written. <laughs> So really, just to prove that the score system works, I'm going to have to choke here and like, oh. So now he got one point. Of course, we can introduce a bit of uh, AI ourselves. If I go here, I can make myself better by, let's do this, <laughs> pull up attribute inspector. And recall that before, we did some scaling of Tommy's face. So here we just have to do, where is it? Uh huh. Uh, tag mode, there we go. Scale to fill. <laughs> OK, so save, reload. This is real, real AI now. So now I hit the screen. No hands. <laughs> <laughs> The sad thing is when I was making this joke in my head last night, I actually lost because it can still actually hit the bottom corner there. <laughs> so this here is Pong. So today we look <laughs> thank, thank you. So this here is Pong, two-dimensional graphics. One of the themes today has been delegation and actually passing messages around. Next week we'll start looking at testing and how you can ensure your code is correct, case in point. But until then, good luck with Evil Hangman. We'll see you next week. <laughs>